that's the good news. That so, zum Abschluss des heutigen ersten Tages spricht jetzt zu uns Lord Christopher Monkton, Third Viscount Monkton of Branchley. Lord Monkton, Sie sind ein unglaublich vielseitiger Mann mit vielen, vielen Interessen, vielen verschiedenen Tätigkeiten im Laufe Ihres Lebens. Wenn man das alles aufführen wollte, müsste man einen eigenen Vortrag halten. Die Zeit dazu haben wir jetzt nicht mehr. Und außerdem, was Sie sagen werden, ist, sehr, ist ja doch jetzt wichtig zu unserem Thema. Nur so viel. Sie sind Journalist, waren auch Herausgeber von Zeitschriften. Sie sind als Unternehmer tätig, diesmal im pharmazeutischen Bereich mit Ihrer Frau zusammen, ist das richtig? Und Sie sind politischer Berater der konservativen Partei in England gewesen, sind dann äh, umgeschwenkt zur UKIP und sind dort der Hauptsprecher zum Thema Klima. Ähm, Sie reisen in viele, viele Länder der Welt, um für Ihre Überzeugung zu kämpfen und gegen die Unvernunft. Sie werden als Redner, als öffentlicher Redner bezeichnet und gleich als nächstes als Klimaleugner. Lord Moncton ist der Klimaleugner. Und Sie sind auch ein Befürworter des Brexit. Aus dem, was ich über Sie gelesen habe, geht hervor, Sie nehmen wirklich kein Blatt vor den Mund, Sie kämpfen für Ihre Überzeugungen, Sie argumentieren brillant und überführen junge Klimaaktivisten, sodass, man, sodass denen nichts mehr einfällt. Also wir freuen uns jetzt über das, was Sie, oder auf das, was Sie uns jetzt über die Unvernunft erzählen werden. Ja. Thank you very much. Meine Damen und Herren, guten Abend oder Grüß Gott. You will forgive me for lapsing lazily into English. I have not yet had the pleasure of learning German to an extent that would not insult you if I tried to speak it. After that over generous but very gratifying introduction. I just can't wait to hear what I'm going to say. But I want to begin on a very serious note, and that is that when unreason triumphs, as it has in the climate debate until now, that triumph will be temporary. But in the meantime, people get hurt. You have just heard from Susan Crockford, the most diligent of polar bear researchers. She gave a first class presentation. You heard earlier from Professor Peter Ridd, another first class presentation on the Great Barrier Reef. Both of these two are victims of the temporary triumph of unreason. Both of them lost their positions in acrimonious and unsatisfactory circumstances, not because they had committed any wrongdoing of any kind, but simply because they, almost alone, had the courage to stand up and speak the truth regardless of the cost to themselves. And ladies and gentlemen, I think that in recognition of their gallantry, their bravery, their courage, and their willingness to speak the truth when others fell silent or did not speak the truth, you should give them a standing ovation.
And I also congratulate the Europäische Institut für Klima und Energie for their courage in laying on this extremely well-attended conference in the most difficult circumstances, in that the previous venue that they had booked and had obtained a contract for was threatened by fascists calling themselves anti-fascists. And when Ake went to the court and said to the judge, please, will you uphold the law of contract and allow us to have the meeting at the venue where we had arranged to have it? The judge, who was a coward, said no. He allowed the fascist bullies to frighten him into cancelling that venue, and in a very short time, it was necessary for the organizers to find this magnificent and splendid neoclassical venue, which was originally the main airport terminal for München. And these you see on the screen now are the kind of people of whom the judge was frightened. Because no longer do these judges always remember the history of Europe only 90 years ago, when freedom of speech was denied and the judges then failed to uphold it and the tragedy that was the Second World War was the direct consequence of that failure. And after the Second World War, this man, whom you have probably never heard of, Ion Mihai Pachepa, he was the founder of the disinformation directorate of the KGB. The Russians got access to Berlin because the Allies hung back in 1945, and they captured the one ministry building still standing, which was the Reichspropagandaamt of Joseph Goebbels in Mauerstraße, at that time the largest office building in the whole of Europe. In that building, all the records were intact, only one wing had been bombed, and Goebbels, who could not believe that the Tausend Jahre Reich was going to come to an end within days, ordered all the records to be preserved. They fell into the hands of the Russians, and they discovered how it was that the Nazis had persuaded Germany to fall silent, as the new fascists of today have persuaded nearly all scientists around the world to fall silent. They did so by an organized campaign of attacking the personal reputations of those who dared to speak out against Nazism. The moment the Russians discovered that was how it was done, they set up the disinformation directorate under Pachepa, and in the next 33 years, he recruited one million willing, unpaid Western communists, and he trained them in how to attack the personal reputations of all those around the world who opposed communism and were successful in speaking out against it. This technique of personal reputational attacks leading, if necessary, to the fate that was meted out to professors Crockford and Ridd, that is where the socialists, the communists, the fascists, call them what you will today, that is where they learnt this method. And that is why these two distinguished professors have suffered as they have. And it is necessary that we should understand this history so that we can understand how it is that we got to where we are today. How then do we deal with this threat? Well, we use the scientific method. And the first thing we do, if we are laymen, as I am, is to ask sensible questions and to go on answering them, asking them until we get sensible answers. And so what I'm going to do is to raise some of the questions that a rational policymaker ought to ask. 
And the first of these questions is, why do the people behind this scam exempt China from the Paris Climate Agreement? If they really believe that global warming is a global crisis, a global emergency, a global catastrophe, a global thermageddon, then surely they must expect the world's largest emitter of CO2 and other greenhouse gases to do its bit to produce less of them. The fact that China and India and many other countries have been exempted from any obligations under the Paris Climate Agreement tells you all you need to know about the true motive of those who are pretending that there is a climate emergency. That motive is to damage and, if possible, destroy the free, Christian, independent, democratic, prosperous West and to transfer our wealth and our power into the hands of those who would use that wealth and that power far less gently and far less kindly than have we. Here you will see, even five years ago, China was already, by a long chalk, the world's largest emitter. And the five-year plans that the regime in Peking issues make it plain that they intend to continue to build coal-fired power stations in very large numbers, numbers so large that they completely dwarf the foolish attempts in the West to close down those coal-fired power stations. Here you can see the trends in coal production on the left and coal consumption on the right in various regions. Asia Pacific, which is largely China, is now very rapidly growing and far away the greatest producer and consumer of coal. And yet, the climate extremists who are busy trying to shut down this blameless meeting have absolutely nothing to say about the role of China in adding greenhouse gases to the atmosphere. Next question that a rational policymaker would ask, what is the, the ideal global mean surface temperature? Does anyone here know the answer to that question? I see no hands. Has anyone ever heard the climate extremists, the climate fanatics, ever asking that question, let alone attempting to answer it? Well, I, as a policymaker and a former advisor to presidents and prime ministers, would have to say to those presidents and prime ministers, and I have, that if we do not know what is the ideal global mean surface temperature, if we have not even bothered to ask that question, let alone try to find an answer to it, then what rational basis is there for saying that a little bit of warmer weather would be a bad thing? There is no basis for any concern about the climate unless and until this question is addressed and the fact that it has not been addressed demonstrates plainly that the climate scam is not scientific, it is anti-scientific, it is purely political. <laughs> and the next question, a rational policymaker, a rational journalist, a rational scientist would ask if he or she were interested in the truth rather than peddling some communist party line or another, is this. Why is global warming so much less than they have been predicting? How often have you seen that question raised in any mainstream news medium? They never ask that question either. And one thing we know is that 
the failure of global warming to happen at anything like the officially predicted rate made by the IPCC in 1990 cannot be blamed on the fact that we have reduced our CO2 emissions so much that the warming is slowing down. Because as you see from the graph there, the red circle on that graph, the CO2 emissions in the most recent year for which we have figures, which was last year, are running at above the business as usual scenario for CO2 emissions predicted by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change in 1990. There has been, for all the talking, for all the endless conferences, I'll be at another UN conference in Madrid next week, for all that talking, for all the trillions spent on the absurd energy vendor and its equivalents around the world, there has been no reduction in emissions of carbon dioxide. And the original prediction of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, as you heard this morning, is that there would be one-third of a Celsius degree of warming every decade. Here is the actual quotation from the IPCC's first assessment report from which you can work that figure out. And now, if we take the longer-term predictions of how much warming we would get eventually, after about 150 years, following a doubling of CO2 concentration, the standard metric for working out how sensitive the climate is to our activities, their best estimate is 4.1 Celsius or Kelvin. And this is the very latest set of figures from the latest generation of the computer models that have caused so much trouble. And this, these date from just September this year. But now you can see on this chart the credibility gap between the amount of global warming that we would expect to have seen, and that's in orange there, the orange cursor, and in purple, the amount of warming predicted by the latest generation of computer models. As you will see, the prediction is about three times the reality. And nobody in the climate change community has bothered to explain, let alone even to ask, why this very large description between unexciting reality and overexcited prediction. And here is how one can actually work out very simply and very directly how much final or equilibrium warming you will get from doubling the CO2 in the atmosphere without using a computer model. You don't even use a, need to use a computer. You can do this sum on your pocket calculator. All you need to know is the radiative forcing of 3.45 watts per square meter, which they say would be caused by a doubling of the CO2 concentration. You multiply that by the amount of warming from 1850 until 2011, the year to which all these numbers were updated for the last major IPCC report in 2013, and you divide that product by the difference between the total man-made radiative forcing over the same period and the radiative imbalance measured over the same period, and that will tell you how much global warming we can expect to see per doubling of CO2 concentration. And it is not 4.1 Celsius, they got it the wrong way round. It's only 1.4 Celsius. But that, of course, is not enough to constitute a problem. And that is why, unless you read Lewis and Curry 2017 and 2018, you will not have come across this formula and you will not have realized how easy it is to calculate our likely effect on the climate just by using an ordinary pocket calculator. Now, why then have their predictions proven so wildly exaggerated? That's the next question I, as a policymaker, have been asking. And let's just look at some of these predictions. They say that droughts are going to increase, but there is no trend in the severity of droughts in the hundred years 
since 1900. You will see that it just goes up and down much as it no doubt has for millennia. No change. But what about the area of the earth that is under drought conditions at any one time? The most comprehensive survey of that question, Howe et al. in 2014, shows a 30-year decline in the global area of land under drought. Sea level change, this is the big scare. And yet, the most efficient of all the satellites that ever went up to measure sea level, which was Envisat, it was a European Union effort, it only lasted for eight years before the elastic bands ran down. But while it was operating, it showed that sea level was rising at the dizzying rate equivalent to 3.2 centimeters per century. It's hardly changing at all anywhere worldwide. And the sea level rise is largely fictional. Here is a paper by Kazanav et al. in 2009 showing that between 2003 and 2008 there had been a decline in measured sea level and this was turned into a large increase after what was called a glacial, a glacial isostatic adjustment. Now, all I'm going to say about the glacial isostatic adjustment is that whether or not such an adjustment was necessary or proper or competently carried out, I can assure you of this. It did not and does not constitute an actual sea level rise. Therefore, we do not face a catastrophe of rising sea level. And the IPCC knows this perfectly well. Here is a graph from their 2013 Fifth Assessment Report, which shows the predictions in each of their previous reports, and you'll see that each prediction is lower than the last. And yet, they presume to tell us that it's worse than we ever did think. And therefore, there's no longer just a crisis, there's an emergency. But as a rational policymaker, I cannot see anything in those figures that suggests an emergency. And then we've just heard about the polar bears and the sea ice. Of course, they evolved between 200,000 and 800,000 years ago from the brown bear, which lived on the land. They still breed on the land. They like warmer weather. They flourish in warmer weather. And in fact, as you can see there, the steady heartbeat of the global sea ice area and trend, there's been virtually no change, if you take it globally, throughout the last 30 or 40 years. And the ocean is not and will not in our time be acid. The last time it was actually acid, was 54 million years ago. You're all too young to remember, but I remember it well. <laughs> and at that time, the ocean was mildly acid. But the corals, which you heard about from Peter Ridd, they evolved, the, uh, the oldest of them, the calcite corals, the really tough ones, they evolved 750 million years ago. I remember that well, too. And it was a good time for corals. That's when they first achieved the algal symbiosis you heard about from Professor Ridd. And then the more delicate aragonite corals, they evolved during the Jurassic era, just 175 million years ago, a blink of an eye in geological time. And they are more delicate. But both of these species of corals survived the acid ocean that happened 54 million years ago during the Paleocene-Eocene thermal maximum. They survived as, to our astonishment, did the Scleractinian corals, which had been widely thought to have become extinct millions of years ago, until just a few years ago, off the coast of Australia, they found a flourishing colony of Scleractinian corals. Now, if the corals have already survived an acid ocean. All the main three families of corals survived an acid ocean. And we know that the corals of the Great Barrier Reef are all present in the much warmer waters of Indonesia further to the north. 
all this nonsense about corals being affected by acid oceans is complete scientific nonsense. And in fact, the ocean will remain alkaline because the rate at which the acid base balance, the pH, is changing is so small that it's only going to be about 0.2 pH points in a century. It might get you from about 7.9 to 8.1, so 8.1 to 7.9 the other way, I'm sorry. So it's not going to make much difference to anything. And all these creatures in the sea, the calcifying organisms, they actually like having a little bit more CO2 in the ocean, a little bit more calcium carbonate as well, which they turn into their shells. So acidification then is a totalitarian fad. You see it started in 2005. They began publishing the first papers on this. And then all the left in academia rushed in with Me Too papers on ocean acidification. And I'm grateful to uh, Greg Wrightstone, who's written a very good book on climate change. Uh, and I wrote the foreword to the book, and I've, I've pinched this graph from him, so do go out and get his book. It has masses of information like this in it. And then there's methane concentration, which was hugely overpredicted. And again, here in the IPCC's 2013 report, in the final draft, which I, as an expert reviewer, saw, they had this graph showing that all the predictions had been wrong and that the actual rate of increase in methane was very harmless. It's a, the gray arrow at the bottom of the diagram there. But this graph didn't make it into the final draft because two nations at the session of the Intergovernmental Panel said that if this graph appeared in the IPCC's report, the skeptics would use it to say there isn't a problem with methane. And they were right about that. <laughs> forest fires we have heard a lot about recently. But most of the forest fires now ravaging Australia and a good number of those in California were started by arsonists. They were started by people who thought, let's burn up the forests and then let's blame it on climate change. But actually, even allowing for all that, forest fires are actually causing less and less damage worldwide each decade, as this graph also from Greg Wrightstone's book makes clear. US heat waves are less common. Heat-related deaths in the US, tumbling. Hurricane activity, as we saw earlier today, decreasing. So why then do they get the science wrong time and time again? And another related question, why are all the discrepancies between what they have predicted and what has happened, always fall in the direction of inventing a problem where there isn't one and then exaggerating it, rather than in the other direction of making the problem look a bit smaller. And again, the fact that very nearly all of these errors go in the direction of exaggeration and invention, and none go in the other direction, tells you that this subject is political and not scientific. Well, one of the things they say is that the final warming or equilibrium sensitivity to our influence on the climate is four times our direct influence. We add greenhouse gases. If you double the CO2 in the atmosphere, it causes one Celsius of warming. And they make that into 4.1 Celsius. They multiply by four because of what are called temperature feedbacks. Here you can see uh, one of the early papers in which this was spelt out explicitly by the nest of vipers at the Goddard Institute for Space Studies. So what they're saying is that for every one Celsius of direct greenhouse gas warming, they imagine there will be three Celsius of feedback response. So the warming from double CO2, one Celsius, Multiply that by four, and you get the 4.1 Celsius that we saw earlier. So what is missing in their calculation? You'll see the question marks there. You see they have a feedback response to the natural greenhouse warming, which happened up until 1850. 
And you see they imagine that uh, feedback response roughly triples the eight Celsius of direct warming caused by the pre-industrial greenhouse gases. None of that anything to do with us. But they have not made any allowance for feedback response to the fact that during the day there is a large yellow object in the sky which is also warming the planet and it's called the sun. And I imagine that every climatologist comes from Scotland because, of course, they don't have the sun in Scotland. But everywhere else in the world, there is the sun. So, what we're going to do is we're going to take some account of the feedback response to the sunshine temperature, or the effective emission temperature, as it's called. And there it is, only about 48 Kelvin of the 255 Kelvin that they imagine is the emission temperature will actually produce a feedback response. So we're going to say that roughly just under a third of that will be added to it to be the feedback response. And yet we're going to say that the feedback response to the natural greenhouse warming is going to be one and a quarter times that natural greenhouse warming. So we're loading all of the the major response, a much bigger feedback response to greenhouse gases than to emission temperature. Even that, that brings the temperature down to 2.3 Celsius, just making that little adjustment. But if we were to make an adjustment so that, roughly speaking, the same unit feedback response to the sunshine will happen as to the greenhouse gases, then the final doubling of CO2 warming comes down to 1.5 Celsius. So it's going to be somewhere between those two numbers. This is not a catastrophe. And this is a very simple calculation to do. Again, you can do it on a pocket calculator. And then you can take various estimates of what that emission temperature is in the absence of the non-condensing greenhouse gases and before we came along. And there are various estimates. And then you can see what are the multiples of the feedback response to the emission temperature, which is implicit in their predictions of the amount of warming from greenhouse gases. And you'll see that they're, they're predicting 30 or 40 times as much feedback response to greenhouse gases as to the sunshine. This is wildly, it's not just Im improbable, it's impossible. And these are the simple things that a layman can do to demonstrate what nonsense this all is. And then, if they are getting the feedback uh, response wrong and magnifying it too much, where is the mistake? In the physical world, where is the mistake? And the answer is that they predict that about uh, 10, or 10, 10 or 12 kilometers up in the tropical mid-troposphere, the weather will warm at three times, two or three times, the surface tropical warming rate because of greenhouse gases. And you'll see this in the IPCC's uh, 2007 report. This is their diagram. But just one problem with that, measurements of the amount of water vapor in the atmosphere at different altitudes, known as the specific humidity, do not show this increase in global warming. Because what you've got instead is a decrease at that altitude. And that means, if anything, a negative water vapor feedback. And so the observations show no tropical mid-troposphere hotspot. They predict this, but that's what is observed. Prediction, observation, prediction, observation. Why do they not ask why there is such a large difference between prediction and observation? Why do they get the emission temperature so wrong? And that's the question we're going to ask now. The temperature in 1850, the surface temperature was 287 Kelvin. But the effective emission temperature, worked out the way they work it out, is only 255 Kelvin, from which they take the one from the other and they say, therefore, the natural greenhouse effect is 32 Kelvin. And that's why they think that greenhouse gases have a really big effect on temperature. But you can see how, what a nonsense their equation is from that red figure four there. That figure four represents the ratio of the spherical surface area of the Earth to the disk presented by the Earth to the Sun, the great circle as it is known. 
And so what they're doing in that equation, which is in all the textbooks and in all the papers, they all mention this, this equation. What they're doing is effectively saying that there's no difference between the temperature characteristics of the day side of the Earth, where the sun is shining, and the night side of the Earth, where temperatures are dominated by emission of infrared radiation from the surface, moderated by the capacity of the ocean in particular, to some extent the land, to retain its heat. These are two very different processes. You can't bung them together in a single equation and expect to get a sensible answer, which is why their figure of 255 Kelvin is nonsense. And here is how it should be done. And here you'll see the results on the right from the Lunar Diviner experiment, looking at the day side. And you'll see that it's a series of concentric rings, effectively, around the subsolar point, the point where the sun is shining directly overhead. And so if we then calculate the cosine of the solar, solar zenith angle and diminish the temperature by that cosine and then run it individually, layer by layer, through the Stefan Boltzmann equation, then you get the correct answer. Now here is the diviner's measurement of the dayside temperatures of the moon done by direct satellite measurement. That is a measured result, and we're going to use that to calibrate the method I have just described. Because now we're going to just use a pocket calculator, that's how I did this last night. We're going to calibrate it, there is the calculated value. Now they spent a billion dollars sending up that satellite, I would have done it for half a billion dollars with my pocket calculator. <laughs> And it gets the same answer. So the calibration of the method is successful. That means we can now apply it to the Earth. We can imagine the Earth with the land and the ocean, with the clouds, but otherwise taking no account of water vapor or its feedback. But we remove the non-condensing greenhouse gases, CO2, methane, nitrous oxide. We remove those and, uh, and ozone, take those out. So we now find out what would be the temperature of the day side of the Earth without those non-condensing greenhouse gases that are said to be causing the problem? And the answer is that in 1850, the temperature on the day side as measured was 291 Kelvin. But the day side temperature without greenhouse gases, calculated by the method we have just calibrated, is 289 Kelvin. And that is a natural greenhouse effect of 2 Kelvin and not 32 Kelvin. Now, admittedly, there is a certain amount of uncertainty in any calculation of this kind. And it may therefore be, and one of, two of my co-authors co agree with me on this, that there is in fact no measurable warming as a consequence of the greenhouse effect at all. Yes, there's a greenhouse effect. Yes, you can measure it in, in a test tube but you cannot necessarily say that therefore there will be warming from the greenhouse effect in the atmosphere. And here is why. Because one of my distinguished co-authors, together with two other authors, have recently investigated the radio sonde records. And these are the atmospheric altitudinal profiles of the warming at different altitudes, pressure altitudes as they're called. So what uh, the, this team did was they rearranged the ideal gas equation to express it in terms of molar density. They solved it for molar density. And suddenly the wiggly lines that you get from the radio sound plots become straight lines, so straight that the coefficient of determination is 0 0.9997. And these are really straight. And what that means is that each of these three regions of the atmosphere, the boundary layer, the troposphere, the tropopause, are each in near perfect, very near perfect, thermodynamic equilibrium. They are ideal gases. And according to a paper by Albert Einstein on quantum radiation published in 1917, 102 years ago, in an ideal gas, the greenhouse effect, though it can be present, cannot cause any warming. So if what I have just outlined to you checks out, that's the end of the global warming panic altogether. But why do they destroy lives and livelihoods for no good reason? 
and without caring about it? What about the jobs of the miners throughout Europe and America who have been told that they are no longer required because their product is contributing to the climate emergency? Of course, all that's happening is the coal mining is being transferred to China and they're, they're digging more coal there. And here's a great way to end poverty. You kill the poor. How do you do that? You deny them access to electricity, which is the greatest health-giving thing you can do to any poor population. 1.3 of our fellow citizens of this planet have no access to electrical power, access being defined as having no more than just one 60-watt light bulb on for four hours a day on average. That's what they call access to electricity. 1.3 billion people don't even have that. So if we want to lift them out of poverty, and we do, then we want to make sure that they're given electricity because in ho homes without mains electricity, 4.3 million people are dying a year from particulate pollution, from cooking fires, and that's just one of the many causes of death from not having electricity. Another is dying in childbirth. 500,000 women a year die in childbirth because they don't have electricity where the child is born. And in Europe, where we have electricity, life expectancy is 80 years. In Africa, only 65 years. And it was only 60 years until recently. They need electricity. They need it now. They need it in a form which is easy to generate, easy to maintain, and cheap. And that means coal-fired power. And look at the difference in IQ. In the well-lit West, 100. In the dazzling Far East, 120. We're pretty dumb compared with the Far East. But in Africa, 70. This is not their fault. It's because they don't have electricity. And when the sun goes down at night, and most climate scientists don't realize it does that, but it does, then they can't read. So of course they're get, they are disadvantaged. And this is an intolerable disadvantage, which it is up to us to try to put right. So what are these agents of genocide in the international organizations doing about this? The World Bank stopped lending for coal-fired power stations nine years ago. And from this year, it's not going to lend for oil and gas extraction either. And from this year, this really astonished me when I discovered this, the African Development Bank is no longer lending for coal-fired power stations because global warming. That is why it matters, ladies and gentlemen, that we get the science right. And here is what Herr Jean Ziegler, the UN's right to food rapporteur, had to say in 2007. He said, it is a crime against humanity to convert agricultural productive soil into soil which produces foodstuffs that will be turned into biofuel to be burnt, not in our bellies, but in motor cars. This is not what we should be doing. We should not be causing the doubling and tripling of food prices globally that has happened in real terms worldwide, again, not because of global warming, but because of global warming policy. Now, why don't they count the environmental cost of environmentalism? They're using the ethanol, as we've seen, this corn, to feed cars and not people. If they put these windmills up, and you have plenty of those in this country, the blades of the new big turbines are traveling at 666 kilometers per hour. The number of the beast, the calculation, is one that you can do on your pocket calculator. This is what happens when birds see blades traveling at that speed. They can't work it out. They get struck out of the sky and killed in their millions, rare birds like eagles. And then the windmills fail, of course, but their biggest problem is that they don't give any emission abatement because, as was explained this morning, they have to have the spinning reserve in coal-fired and gas-fired power stations running all the time in case the wind blows too much or not at all, or in case the wretched things catch fire. Then the solar panels. The trouble with solar panels, don't tell the climate scientists, they'd be terribly upset if they found out, they don't work at all well at night. 
Scientists are doing their best to remedy this, but they haven't found an answer to it yet. And the other big problem is low energy density. You have to cover acres and acres, hectares and hectares of land in order to generate very small amounts of electricity. And then there are electric motor vehicles where because of the extra weight of the batteries and therefore the extra energy that has to be used, they use 30% more energy than an ordinary real motor car does. And the effect of that is to reduce the efficiency of your typical electric car's energy to that which uh, the real motor cars running on gasoline achieved in the 1950s. That's how silly that is. Why don't they count the benefits of more CO2 in the air, more crops, better crops? Here is Craig Idso's analysis about 40 different crops, all of which will grow more luxuriantly and give better yields if there's more CO2 in the air. CO2 is plant food. It's greening the planet. Even with all the de deforestation, the planet has grown greener. The total plant biomass on the Earth has increased by somewhere between 15 and 25 percent over the last 30 years, thanks to the extra CO2 we are putting in the atmosphere. That is a good thing. And then keeping um, people cold kills them. As the EU discovered when it did a survey to say how much extra deaths will happen in Europe by 2080 if we increase the world's temperature by 5.4 Celsius. It's not going to be 5.4, it's going to be more like 1 Celsius, so don't worry. Well, they found out to their horror that the prevented deaths from cold would far outstrip the deaths that would happen from warmer weather. And even with 5.4 Kelvin of warming, 94,000 extra lives would still be alive in 60 years' time, thanks to the warmer weather. They don't publicize that result, as you can imagine. And why don't they ask the candy cane question? Now, the candy cane question is a question that every child in, a, in the United States asks when he picks up a few coins from the gutter, goes into the sweetie shop, puts them on the counter with his sticky hand and says, say, mister, how many candy canes can I get for this? The first thing you have to ask in any economic analysis is how much can I buy with the money I'm spending, especially if it's taxpayers' money. But they never ask that question. If they did, they would find out that you have to use discounting to present value using a thing called a discount rate. The market discount rate is at minimum 5%, more usually 7 or 8 in real terms every year. But they only use a discount rate of 1.3%. So it makes it look as though investing, so-called, in making non-existent global warming go away is somehow going to be beneficial. And in fact, that 1.3% rate is based, but they don't tell you this, on a 1 in 10 chance that the planet will not see out this century because of the tiny global warming that we will cause. That is how silly, that is how militantly, totally irrational is this monstrous climate scam. And totalitarianism doesn't just harm present generations. All those people in Africa dying because we are denying them electricity because we know better than they do. It's also harming future generations because by wrecking the economies of the West, we are making the inheritance of our children and theirs a great deal smaller than it would otherwise be. And if you use a proper discount rate instead of the artificially low one, then the 3% cost uh, of GDP throughout the 21st century caused by global warming comes down to 0.3%. So CO2 mitigation strategies inexpensive enough to be affordable will be ineffective. If they're costly enough to be effective, they will be unaffordable. Focused adaptation is better. The cost of the premium greatly exceeds the cost of the risk insured, so don't insure. Not a single penny should be spent on trying to make global warming go away. There won't be enough of it to matter, and what there is will be good for us. Climate concerns sprang from an elementary error of physics. After correction, there will be perhaps 1.3, 1.5 degrees of warming by 2100. Warming will be net beneficial. The cost of climate action exceeds any legitimately foreseeable benefit. So the rational policymaker 
on reviewing the evidence that I have summarized rather breathlessly in front of you today, would conclude that the rational policy is to do nothing and spend nothing. Otherwise, Europe will end up like Zimbabwe, printing banknotes like this. So I, went, I end by saying this to you. We will not be silenced by fascists calling themselves anti-fascists. We will not be silenced by communists calling themselves socialists. We will not be silenced by judges who are cowards and call themselves judges. We will tell the truth whether these people like it or not. Thank you. Vielen Dank, herzlichen Dank. Ich glaube, wir könnten natürlich jetzt noch mindestens, mindestens eine Stunde oder zwei weiter hier diskutieren, Fragen und Antwort. Du bist die ganze Zeit noch hier, bis zum Sonntag. Yes. Und für yes. alle, ich lade alle ein, weil wir, wir haben jetzt 7 Uhr, drüben gibt es Essen, dass wir an der Stelle jetzt nicht noch eine Frage Antwort machen. Wer jetzt Fragen heute Abend hat oder auch die ganze Zeit, empfehle ich, hängt sich gleich an Lord Moncton dran, setzt sich zu ihm an den Tisch oder spricht mit ihm in der Schlange oder was auch immer. Ich glaube, dem ist es auch gar nichts mehr hinzuzufügen.